Well, thank you so much for being here. I am so excited to be presenting today. And the course today is called Make It Easy, How to Eliminate Customer Confusion So That We Can Sell More Products. I think everybody wants to do that, right? We all want to sell more fireplaces. But the reality is that there's a really serious problem in our industry right now. And this is something that I don't hear anybody talking about. I don't hear it from manufacturers, distributors, retailers, anybody. But it's that we are actively confusing customers out of buying our products. And this is happening all the time by like the thousands and thousands every year. But no one's talking about it because we're not aware. So we're going to get into some things today that, that might be eye-opening, they might challenge a little bit, but I'm going to ask you guys to stay with me. The course that I've been on for the last five years or so has been kind of breaking down my own sales process and building it back up from the ground with the customer in mind so that we can make it easier to do business with us. And so I'm really excited to share that with you guys. As we get rolling here, this course is going to help you do three things. I like things simple, we're only going to focus on three. Number one, cut out all the noise that is confusing your customers. That's going to be really, really critical. We're going to talk about what a noisy and busy world we live in and that if we want to have any hope of breaking through to have a relevant message to the people that we're selling to, we got to come with clarity and simplicity breaking through the noise. Number two is that this course is going to help you reframe your messaging so that you only talk about the problems that you solve for your customer. And this is something that's kind of backwards that very often if you do an audit on the marketing and the advertising that's done in this industry and you do an audit on the sales process that a lot of companies have, we don't frame things from the perspective of solving customers' problems. Were any of you guys in Jerry's course who was just in here a second ago? Right, Jerry hit on that so hard and it was amazing because we are in the business of solving problems. And if we don't identify with that problem and talk about our solutions from that perspective, it's white noise and it honestly just confuses customers and they don't buy from us. The last thing, number three, is that this course is gonna help you create tools that make it easy for your team to sell. Now, your team may be small, it might just be you and another person, it might be a whole bunch of people, but either way, there's tools you can create that are gonna set you up for success long-term. And so I'm really excited just to share some of the things that I've learned that have helped me and I know they can help your guys' businesses too. A, a lot of this might sound radical or, or different than what you're used to hearing. And, and I know what that's like. So my name is Tim Reed and I've been in the hearth industry now for about 14 years, which you know, isn't anything compared to some of the people here. That There's a lot of folks that have been doing this for a long time and doing really, really good things in your business. But what I found after years and years and years was that I was stuck in a tunnel vision of just thinking that the way we did it was right. And it took, honestly, swallowing a lot of humility to realize that we were actually not connecting with the customer the way that we should and we were actually confusing customers. So I'm really stoked to share this content because this is like, this isn't theory, it's just practical wisdom that I've been able to apply. Um, I managed five retail showrooms in the Pacific Northwest for Fireside Home Solutions. And the principles that we talk about today have made our company millions and millions of dollars. And I know that they can do the same for you. I know that they can make an impact to remove customer confusion so that it can be really easy. Now, as we get going here, um, I've got some handouts in front. I hope that there's enough for everybody, and if not, maybe there's someone close by that'll share with you. But go ahead and fill that out as I'm talking here, and don't be afraid to throw up a hand or just interrupt me, and, and we're gonna do this back and forth, because ultimately, the, the goal of this course isn't for you guys just to listen to me talk for an hour. It doesn't do any good. But what we wanna try to do is to be able to get you some, some principles that you can take to the bank and make a difference in your business. And the only way to do that is if we go back and forth a little bit. So I talk real loud and uh, I promise that, you know, if you interrupt me, I'll be really gracious and we'll, we'll dive into what you have to say. But use that handout because that's what's gonna make the difference long term. Like I said, listening to me for an hour is not gonna do it. But if you can follow along in the handout and write down some notes, it's gonna give you ammunition and steps to go back into your businesses and take control. That sound good? Cool. Well, hey, did anybody come out and see me last year at Expo? All right, we got a couple. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for coming back. Appreciate that. Well, so like we talked about, you know, there, there's a really serious problem in our industry that, that no one's talking about, and it is that we are confusing customers out of buying our products. And really, the, the truth of it is, like I said, is that, is that most companies don't even know it. You know, we use all kinds of insider language that only other hearth experts understand. We talk over people's heads, we go too fast, 
Our websites are confusing. There's all these different things that we're doing. And I mean, now it's easy to say, well, all my competition does that, but, but I don't do that. You know, and the truth of the matter is like, how often do we get someone coming into one of our showrooms that's like, I've been to five other places and no one can help me. Can you, someone please just take my money and help me? Have you guys ever had that happen to you? Yeah. I mean, we have that happen a lot. And if we're being honest, it probably happens to us also where someone goes to our competition after visiting our store. So the goal for today is to just eliminate this confusion. Now, I think that one of the hardest things to do is to change. And uh, Grant Falco had just this amazing social media presentation earlier today in the same room actually. And he talked about how in business, if you're gonna improve, the only way to do it is to change. It, it really is that you, that, that you cannot improve if things don't change. And so, you know, like I said, today there might be some new concepts. It's actually gonna harmonize really well with what Grant talked about and with what Jerry just talked about. But the big thing I found is that in order to take the steps we need to take to grow in this changing landscape, we gotta be willing to reevaluate what we do. Because our industry, we're, we're at a fulcrum right now, we're at a turning point where we have not been disrupted yet, but the tide is shifting. And if we don't take control as retailers, we will be disrupted. So it's up to us to take that step and make it easy for people to buy from us. Now I wanna share an inspiring quote. This is, you might have seen it on, like a, on a wall or on Instagram or something, but here it is. Buying a fireplace is confusing and difficult, said everyone always. Have you guys heard this quote before? Does anybody disagree with this? I mean, it, like, isn't it, it's hard to buy a fireplace, right? I mean, because how often do people buy them? Once? Yeah, I, I got a good friend that says, you know, it's like, it's like buying a wedding dress. You do it once, maybe twice, and you don't want to make a mistake. That's the truth. I mean, people don't buy these enough to be familiar with the category. And this is what Jerry did such a good job about talking in the previous class is that, is that for, for us being hearth experts, we understand the process. And so it's easy to us, but that's not true for our consumers. And generally speaking, they are very confused by the process. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive in and find out why. And this has really always been true. It, it's always been the case that buying a fireplace can be difficult. But the reason it's more relevant now than ever is because the customer experience has changed. In the last 10 years, we all know this, don't we? You know, if we, if we audit our own consumer behavior, you know, we all know that things have changed. You know, Amazon and Uber, I got, I got the slides there because they've, they've changed the game for everybody. And the truth of the matter is that we are all held to the customer service standard that Amazon and Uber have set. Whether we like it or not, this is what our customers are dealing with every single day and they expect our companies to be the same. Now, obviously, fireplaces are a lot more complicated than hailing a cab. But it doesn't change the fact that that's the consumer expectation, is that level of ease. And that jumps into the next point that, that because of how the market has changed, speed and convenience have become the new expertise. That we are no longer judged on what we know, we're judged on how fast and easy can we make it for customers. And if we don't focus on speed and convenience, then customers don't regard us as the expert anymore. And they get confused and the project stalls out and they don't buy. Has anybody here had, had instances where the project stalled out because we weren't, yeah. I mean, it happens, it happens to all of us, doesn't it? I mean, people want stuff yesterday, they want it quick, they want it fast, because you know, things have changed. The next, the next point here is that the rules of advertising are changing, and the reason why is because we live in a noisy, busy world. I mean, the last 10 years, it has gotten radically busy as the smartphone has taken over everything, and like, we have not even scratched the surface of what the smartphone is gonna do, and we've already seen it starting to disrupt things. But as there's more and more noise through advertising and marketing and things like that that are coming into play, it's up to us to make sure that we are speaking to customers clearly and in the right way. Because every single one of our companies is fighting for relevance in a way that we weren't. You know, I mean, 20 years ago, it was as simple as running a TV ad or having a really creative newspaper ad. And people would just come to you. And that's just not the case anymore. I'm not saying that, that TV and print are totally dead, that there's a time and place to do that sort of thing. But, but the effectiveness, I mean, we all got to agree, just measuring our own consumer habits, right? I mean, it's, it's way less effective because with all of us, as soon as the TV commercial comes on, we instantly pull up our smartphones and we start doing something else. And it doesn't matter that the TV commercial's playing because our attention's not on it. And as things have gotten busier and busier and busier, 
we are starting to tune out more things. And so we have to have speed and convenience to break through all the noise. Does that make sense? OK. So if we, if we look at this, and, and I'm talking about how hearth companies often confuse customers, there's, there's a few different things here. And we can, we can dialogue about this. But you know, number one, most hearth companies confuse customers with their website. Now, I'm not going to make you guys audit your own website. But do any of you guys go to your competitors' websites and think, oh my gosh, I can't believe people actually go to this website? Is there anybody? See some hands? Yep. I think that the, the truth of the matter is that ours probably confuses customers a lot too. And the thing that we have to think about is our website is not being judged against our competitors' website. Our website's being judged against Amazon's website, and Tesla's website, and Lexus, and Toyota, and Apple. That's what our customers are used to seeing. And so it doesn't matter if our website is a little bit better than our competitors. If we have a website that even remotely confuses them, they hit the back button. And they don't, you know, they don't do anything with us. You know, next up is, is confusing insider language, where we, just, we speak over customers' heads. And, and the whole thing is that we have like a really technical industry, don't we? I mean, we got clearances and BTUs, and we got chimney safety, and we have all these different things that we have to worry about. And it's really good we understand those things, but our customers don't. And so often, I mean, I, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, and I secret shop my competition all the time. And I'm not joking, like, I am always being talked to way over my head if I'm a consumer. This happens every day of the week. And I think if we're honest, looking at our own sales teams, we can get caught in this because for us, the language is really familiar and it makes sense. But it's just it's really difficult and confusing for consumers. So next up is that you know, most companies are confusing customers by only talking about themselves. Do any of you guys have any maybe sales reps or people that try to sell to you that only talk about themselves? Anyone have a funny story about that? Has a rep ever talked themselves out of a sale because they wouldn't shut up about themselves and their products? They didn't care about you, the customer? So this is, this is a great story. Um, so we sell fireplaces and garage doors at our company. And I got a call one time from a, a garage door rep that wanted to come in and see me. And, he's, and he, he got my cell phone number somehow. And he calls me and he says, you know, hey, Tim, I got this great product. And I want to I talk to you about it. And I said, OK. I said, hey, so have you been to visit our showrooms and kind of and seen the weaknesses that we have with our product lines? And he goes, well, yeah, I've been to your showrooms a couple times, and I think we're going to be a great fit. And I was like, OK, perfect. So what, what are we missing that your product is going to fill? What's the pain point that we have? And he goes, well, we've been doing this for 30 years, and we build the highest quality garage doors. And you know, when it comes to integrity and quality, you're never going to get anything better. And I said, OK, that's great, but, but why do I need it? You know, what is the pain point that I have that this is going to be a solution for? And there was like a long pause. And he said, well, I guess, I guess I'm not sure, but we make really good garage doors. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you make good garage doors, but I don't need them. I've got good garage doors already. So, you know, give me a call if you ever find a pain point that we have that your product can fill. But this happens all the time. We're so used to talking about ourselves. And it's easy to poke fun at people. But the truth is, I think, I think that we all do this sometimes. That when we get nervous, when we're not prepared, we default to talking about ourselves, don't we? So next up is that so often we make customers jump through all kinds of hoops to get an estimate. Does anybody here want to be honest? Like, does anybody have a complicated estimate process in your business? No, it's all, it's all simple. So all of you are saying, OK, yes, we got some honesty here. For everybody else, though, less than five minutes in the showroom, a customer can get an estimate? Or is it, is it a little bit more complicated than that? Well, you got to go after the house and see what's going on. Got to go out to the house, yep. And then spend some time, hours, just doing the estimate. Yep. It to the customer. Yeah, there's some complexity there. What did you have back there? Totally. And honestly, that's par for the course. It, it really is. And it, we, we sell a complex product. And I'm not minimizing the fact that we sell a complex product. But, but you hit it on the head that so often 
We have to send things back to the shop. It takes time. It takes effort. And again, we're not saying that that's right or wrong, but just think about the average consumer experience. If they're going into Home Depot to buy a dishwasher, does it take that amount of time and effort and headache? No. I mean, and, and now we say, well, we sell fireplaces, not dishwashers. True. But in our customers' minds, it's no different. You know, your customer is thinking, I go to Home Depot and 48 hours later, this thing's installed. Why is your stupid fireplace any different than that? I mean, really, and right or wrong, that's the perception that, that we're up against. And so that's what this whole course is about, is how can we frame things in a way that makes it easier? Lastly is that we haven't even gotten to the buying process yet, but very often buying a fireplace is, is complicated. It's really easy for us. You know, for us, we think, oh yeah, we should take the deposit, we'll schedule the in-home preview, we'll get them in the books, we'll come out and do the first installation trip. After that, we'll pull the permit, and then finally we'll come back out for a light off. It's really simple for us. But again, the customer has, has no clue. They have no clue about all the steps involved. And so, you know, do you guys ever get customers that you'll, you'll say, oh, yeah, and we're going to come out next and, and uh, have the inspection? And they go, what? You have to, you're going to send someone in my house to inspect it? You guys ever get that? You know, you have to come back out a second time. And this is just par for the course. So whether we like it or not, a lot of companies are doing things like this to confuse customers. And this is what's going through customers' heads. You know, it really is, because you think, if manufacturers haven't confused them enough with their bad website, and then they get to a dealer, not you guys, all your competition, who confuses them with an even worse website, and then they drive 30 minutes into the showroom to spend 45 minutes with a salesperson who can't give them a number, and then they schedule an estimator to come out to their house, which takes a week and a half, and hopefully they show up on time. And then the estimator spends 30 to 45 minutes on site, and then the estimator says, you know what, I gotta go back to the office, crunch the numbers, goes back to the office, and hopefully five days later, the customer gets a proposal. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but this is, this is what's happening to a customer because it's just it's so different than anything else that we deal with. So the, the truth of the matter is that customers, they feel uh, frustrated, they feel confused, stupid, ignored, and, and most customers feel like giving up. It, it's really the truth of the matter. And so we want to go to war with this. We want to make it so easy to buy from us that there's no excuse not to because this is how customers feel. And the truth of the matter Guys, I'm dead serious when I say this, that we lose more jobs to indecision than competition. We really do. We are actively confusing people out of buying a fireplace. And if you guys are sales leaders, I hope that you're auditing every proposal that you write up. Whether you do that manually, whether you use a CRM software system, you know, Every sales leader should know what happens to every single proposal that's been written up. And as we've audited the jobs, I mean, I'm pointing the finger at myself here. I think that I run a great team, but honestly, even for us, we're still on this journey. We lose jobs four to one to indecision over competition, four to one. And it's not that the project was too expensive, but it's that, yeah, you know what? We just, we just put it off. It was, just, it was just too much of a hassle. And if you guys aren't auditing it, this, I mean, if you start auditing, this is what you're gonna find. So we lose more jobs to indecision than competition. And I know that, you know, I'm, I sound like I have it all together, and I'm talking loud and proud. Like Jerry said earlier, I'm in presentation mode right now. But the truth of the matter is that, like, I know what this is like because I have lived and breathed this for the last 14 years. And nine of those 14 years were spent with my nose to the grindstone in tunnel vision mode, thinking that the way I'd always done it was the right way. And it's only been in the last five years that I've been able to kind of take a step back and look at what we do to build systems and processes that make it stupidly simple to buy from us. The results have been fantastic. So I want to share this with you guys from a posture of humility saying like, I'm still on the journey too, but these are the steps that we've taken just to have wild, wild success in our stores. And I want to be able to share that with you guys. So as we get going here, I want to share a, a quote by Donald Miller. And Donald Miller is the CEO of a company called StoryBrand out of Nashville, Tennessee. They're an unbelievable marketing company. But Donna Miller says that customers don't buy from the companies that offer the best products and services available. Customers buy from the companies that are the easiest to do business with. So let that sink in. Customers don't buy from the companies who offer the best products and services available. They buy from the companies that are easiest to do business with. So we all think we sell better products than our competitors. But if they're easier to buy from than us, who's our customer going to buy from? No one? 
Yeah, they're gonna buy from the competitor, absolutely. So this is the framework, guys, is that, is that we gotta go all in on making it easy. And if we're looking at that, you know, how do we make it easy? It, it's really three things, and this is the heart of where we're gonna go today, and this is where I'd really invite you guys to raise your hand, and even to push back if, if it seems strange. But, but number one, we need to cut out the noise. Because we live in a noisy world, people are being blasted with advertisements every day, and it's up to us to cut through that. Number two is that once we've cut through the noise and delivered a clear message to our customer, we need to make sure that we reframe what we say to only talk about the problems that we solve. And that's a huge shift in our mentality for sales and advertising and marketing, but we have to reframe what we do to only talk about the problems that we solve. If, if it is not going to pertain to solving a customer's problem, we don't need to talk about it. Just like that garage door wrap. I don't care how good his garage doors are. I got plenty of good garage doors. If he can't talk to me about the problems that I have, I'm not interested in what he has to sell. And I think we're all the same way, aren't we? The last one is we got to create simple tools to help our team sell more. And there's some really practical ways you can do this. And we've just seen rampant success with it. I know that, I know that you guys can too. So we're going to take a deep dive on each of these right here. And number one, starting out with cutting out the noise. So you know, how is it that we cut out the noise? Well, we got to be radically simple with what we say. So this is something that, that Donna Miller talks about is that the way that our brains work, at all times our brains are trying to find something to help us survive and thrive, or they're tuning things out so they can conserve calories. It's the only thing our brains are doing. And so when we're being blasted with a million ads a day, I think the total is like 3,000 ads a day or something like that now, it's insane. But what's happening is that our brains are always making a decision. Is this gonna help me survive and thrive, or is it not? And if our brains decide that it's not, we shut it out, and we tune it out, we decide not to do anything. It's really what's going on. So we gotta be radically simple and clear. So the way that we do that, number one, is if we're going to cut out the noise that's out there, it's got to start with the way that we speak. So I'm going to throw it out there. Does, can anybody think of like a piece of industry terminology that we use all the time with customers that in reality we probably shouldn't because it's confusing? Okay, BTU is number one. Zero clearance fireplace. Yes. Okay. Pan. Pan. That's a good one. Anything else? Vent free. Vent free. NFP 211. NFP 211. Inserts versus fireplaces. Thank you, Grant. Anything else? Yeah. Parging. What was that? Parging. I don't even know what that is. Parging? Parging is okay. <laughs> All right. So that. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, but guys, like, this is, the, this is the truth, is that, like, we got to cut out some of that noise. So right here, you know, no more insider language. And I love, you guys are already ahead of me coming up with those things, right? BTUs. What's a BTU? Does anyone here, NFI people, you guys know what a BTU is? Okay, what's a British thermal unit? The amount of energy required to raise one cubic foot of water, one degree at sea level. Great, I've got 35,000 of those. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. It's like, oh yeah, I got 35,000 of these. It's just the truth. Zero clearance fireplaces. Now. I don't want to rant about this too long. You guys can tell I get really fired up about stuff. Like right now I'm at an eight. You don't want to see me at a 10. So, but you think about the zero clearance fireplace. How often in our showrooms do we have them divided by inserts with a big sign and the zero clearance fireplaces with another sign? It doesn't do the customers any good. They don't know the difference. Our websites. Why on earth on our websites do we have inserts and zero clearance fireplaces? Because our customers don't know the difference. They get confused. Obviously, we need to know the difference, but there's a way we can speak to our customers that helps them along and doesn't make them feel stupid and confused. Because the reality is, if we just start throwing this insider language at customers, they're just gonna get bombarded by it and they're gonna shut down. Their brains are gonna say, you know what? It's too complicated. It's not gonna help me survive and thrive. I'm going somewhere else. You know, intermittent pilot ignition system, direct vent technology, secondary combustion, vertical termination, pan, that was great. Um, this is par for the course for us because we're hearth experts. And what, what all of this comes down to is this, is that every single one of us fights the curse of knowledge. We all fight the curse of knowledge. And this comes from Lee Lefevre. It's from a book that's called The Art of Explanation. I'd highly recommend it. But basically what this is, is that when you take any subject, we'll take fireplaces. Say you have a knowledge scale on a scale of one to 10. Okay? so. We are all hearth experts, I hope. And so we're operating at like a nine or a 10 on this scale, right? And that's a good thing 
because we're putting a fire in people's houses on purpose. This is a really good thing that we're operating at a nine or a 10. So often when we try to simplify things for a customer, we bring it down to a six or a seven. But the problem is that customers are buying at a one or a two. It's the curse of knowledge. For us, it seems second nature. It really does. We think it makes sense. We think that we are speaking their language, but we're not. We're bringing it down to a six or a seven. So what we have to do is go all in on how can we make this simple for customers. And customers aren't stupid. They're really smart, and they're doing a ton of research. The problem is they're not experts like we are. You know, a crash course on Google for four hours is going to teach you some things, but not everything. And so it's the companies that can speak at that one or a two level in everything they do, in their advertising, their marketing, their sales, they're going to connect with a customer to where they understand the value, how this is going to help them survive and thrive, and they're going to be compelled to go through to a purchase. The thing with the curse of knowledge is that it, it comes down to a mantra that one of my friends named Tim Rethlick says all the time, and it's slow is fast that you got to go slow on the front end to run on the back end. Otherwise, it's going to be backwards. So give you an example. Like I said, I secret shop all the time. And uh, I went into a major, major, major competitor of ours fairly recently. And I got asked two questions. And within 30 seconds, I was being shown a fireplace. Question number one, how many square feet you got? OK, I guess three questions. The first one was, how you doing? I said, great. The next question was, how many square feet you got? And I said, uh, you know, about 1,500 or so. Are you looking for an insert or a built-in? As a, as a consumer, I mean, we are not qualified to answer that question. We really aren't. So I gave a vague answer, and he thought that he understood me. And 40 minutes later, he got done with the presentation. I had not been asked one question. I had not said one word. And I said, oh, well, my house actually isn't like that. And we had to start all the way over again. I could see like his eyes just be like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> we started all the way over. He was totally thrown off, and the rest of the presentation was terrible. Slow is fast. Go slow on the front end to run on the back end. And what you can do is you can take those industry terms. You know, one of my favorite ones, intermittent pilot ignition system, IPI. We use that all the time. We tell customers, oh, this has an IPI system. This is going to be great. It's going to save you so much money. IPI, great. I mean, I don't know what that means. Is it like a PhD or like an MBA? I mean, I don't, I don't know. You know, Grant Falco right here has one of the best examples I've ever heard. Don't call it IPI. Call it a pilot on demand system. So a customer comes in, and instead of talking to him about, yeah, this is a 35,000 BTU fireplace, and man, it's going to be so awesome because it uses an IPI system that's going to save you just a lot of money, and it's got this direct vent technology that uses sealed combustion just to, to seal your chimney off, and you're going to get so much efficiency in your house. You've just blasted the customer with you know, a shotgun of information, and they can't handle it. <laughs> so instead, what you've got to do is say, you know what? Man, there's nothing worse than having a pilot light burning all the time. And you know what? Old fireplaces, most of them, they have a little pilot light going all the time, and that thing's actually costing you money every single second that you're using it. Now, these new fireplaces are really cool. They have a pilot on demand system. As soon as you hit this remote, you'll turn the pilot light on, you'll use your fireplace. The second that you're done, you turn your fireplace off with your remote, all the gas shuts off. So you're only going to pay for gas when you want to use it. Isn't that amazing? OK, we're speaking at a one or a two. One or a two, not a six or a seven. Now, it takes more time to do that. And I can't rattle off BTUs and square footage and zero clearance and chase pans. I can't do that when I'm going this slow to explain. But the beauty of it is that I'm speaking at their level. And I'm telling you that if you can speak at a one or a two and go slow on the front end, you don't need to say as much. You really don't. Because so often, we use these pieces of terminology here to make ourselves sound smart. I mean, a lot of salespeople do. They want to come across as smart. The issue with that is that customers don't care how smart you are. They really don't. What customers want is they want to be able to solve the problem. So if we stop using insider language and we fight the curse of knowledge by speaking at a one or a two, we will cut through the noise. Any questions on the curse of knowledge before we move on to the next thing? Yeah. Well, that's really good. And I think that that's probably a conversation with get your installers in there, get your sales team in there, and start brainstorming that. You know, square footage, I'd say most people probably know the square footage of their home. It's a somewhat familiar category, you know, for a home purchase. Um, asking questions like, is it one level? Is it two levels? Do you have really tall ceilings? Is it a really open concept space? Like, compared to the showroom here, how big do you think your space is? You know, there, there's things you can do to build bridges of familiarity. And it's going to be different for every business. But, but I would spend some time 
probably as a, as a group dialoguing that because there is information that we need. And I'm, I'm not trying to make this sound like we can't get the answers to technical questions because there, there are technical questions we need to get the answers to. But we just need to make sure that the way we present that information is at a 1 or a 2, not a 9 or a 10. And it means that, honestly, we got to go really, really slow. You know, salespeople are so quick to run, you know, 90 miles an hour with their hair on fire. We're always looking for the next thing to do, the next thing to do, the next thing to do, and we just steamroll our customers because of it. We're too busy wanting to get to the next customer that we steamroll the one that's right in front of us. So number two is this. We need to reframe our messaging to only talk about what solves our customers' problems. The truth of the matter here is that the only reason customers come to see us is because they have a problem. I mean, we, we are not like Ikea, where people just roll in there on a Saturday because they got nothing better to do. <laughs> we really aren't. You know, and if your locations are anything like mine, they are unbelievably hard to find and parking is terrible. <laughs> it really is. And so like, what I know is that if someone has driven all the way to my showroom, parked at a difficult place, and made it into a fireplace shop, they're probably pretty serious. There's, there's, there's most likely a problem that they have. And so we got to reframe our messaging to talk about that. Because the reality is customers don't care about our story. They really don't. Grant and I were visiting a manufacturer about a year ago. And they were talking with us about a new marketing piece that they were working on. They were super, super excited about it. And uh, the, the CEO of this company is like, oh my gosh, guys, this is going to be the most amazing POP piece that you're ever going to see. We want this thing front and center in all of your showrooms. And they brought it out. It was about you know, three feet wide, four feet high. Guess what it was? It was our company story. In 1975, so-and-so started this company with nothing but a nickel in his pocket and the American dream. And after that, he's built his first wood stove. And then 10 years later, they built the plant. And after that, they developed a gas stove. And it's like going through all this. And, and they said, what do you think? And the first question I asked was, do you want me to be honest? But the second thing I said is I said, I would never put this in my showroom because my customers don't care. There's nothing in here that solves the problem that my customer is coming in for. And so we got to think about this with our marketing. I mean, I flip through the trade show or the industry magazines every month. You know, I look at the, the ads that get sent to me by sales companies and by reps and manufacturers. Guys, no one is talking about the customer's problem. You know, if you're, if you're a manufacturer selling to a dealer, what would you guys rather have? Would you rather have someone that comes and tells you about all the new features and benefits, blasts you with a million fireplaces, a million different sizes, and leaves you a stack of literature on your desk because they want to make sure they cover everything? Or would you rather have someone come that understands your business and says, you know what? I spent a lot of time in your store. I think this is a pain point that you're getting taken advantage of on, and I would love to help you with that. I think I got a solution that can make you some money. I mean, is it any question who we want to buy from? So we got to do this. We got to reframe what we say to only talk about the customer's problem. So if what we are going to say does not pertain to the problem that the customer has, we got to shut our mouth. We cannot talk about it because it's just confusing white noise that gets lost. Now, if we're going to reframe our messaging to address a customer's problem, what do we have to do first? Yes, who said that? Oh my gosh, what's your name? Thank you, Leslie. That is awesome. We have to know the problem. I'm going to pick on you again. That was really good. We have to know the problem, right? Because if you don't know the problem, how in the world can you show them a solution to it? We can uncover a customer's problem starting by asking questions. I mean, isn't that the first thing that we have to do? We've got to ask questions. The reality is, we're going to talk about sales process later in this presentation, but the way that my company works is that we have a seven-step sales process that we utilize. That might, might sound scary, it's really not simple, but a huge part of our process is called understanding. That we got to spend time understanding the customer's problem before we show them anything. Otherwise, we're going to do what that competitor did to me. We're 30 seconds in, we're being shown a fireplace that doesn't work, you find out 40 minutes later, by then the customer's burned out and you're frustrated as a salesperson, and that doesn't make for a good experience for anybody. Okay, so we gotta ask questions. Now, after we ask questions, and you guys can cheat because it's up on the board, but what, after, after asking questions, what's the next thing you gotta do? Listen, right. Now, okay. Can you listen to them? <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta listen to them. You can't listen to yourself think. You can't, you can't think about the next thing that you're gonna say, right? So listening means that our mouths are Shut, closed. Yes, that's right. So listening means our mouths are closed. 
And if we're gonna listen really, really, really well, say it's like a really busy Saturday, and you've had you know, five customers in one after another, you can't keep anybody straight, how can you make sure that you're listening well? Take notes. Guys, I'm telling you that having your salespeople take notes on the floor is like one of the highest impact things you can do. It really is. When I secret shop, I have never once, never once encountered a competitor whose salesperson took notes. Yes? So what do they have, a clipboard and a sheet? What do your salespeople have? Really good question. So he asked the question, what do they have for taking notes? I say it's completely contextual to your business. I am not a micromanager. So if it's, if it's good for them to use notes on their phone, to use an iPad, to use a clipboard, uh, just a blank piece of paper, a notepad, it, it doesn't matter to me. That what's more important is that we're taking notes rather than the method that they get taken. So whatever is best for your business is totally fine. But taking notes does a couple things. Number one, it makes you more attentive. Again, when you got five customers coming in, I mean, I feel like I'm, I got, pretty good wits and I can kind of think on my feet, but after five customers, I can't remember one thing from the next. I don't remember who came in. I think that's the truth for all of us, isn't it? So we got to take notes if we're going to uncover these problems. It also makes the customer feel like you really care about them, even if all you do is write down their name. And so later in the conversation, you can call them by name because you wrote it down. This will go a long ways with your customers. A great one is making observations. There's an amazing book it's actually not even about sales, it's about negotiation. The book is called Never Split the Difference. And it's by a guy named Chris Voss, and it's all about negotiation, but he has an amazing technique that he calls labeling. And the idea is when, to uncover a customer's problem when you're asking questions, sometimes they are not even fully aware of their problem, or maybe they don't wanna tell you it sometimes, that, that happens if we're being real. But we can actually compel them to talk to us by making observations, and the three magic words are, it seems like. So saying that is very non-abrasive. Well, it seems like. That's what we gotta say to customers. So when they're talking to you, just one second. When, when they're talking to you, if they, like, so if, if they tell you all about an you know, in, in open room, they say, hey, tell me about your house. And they go, oh yeah, we got this great room and it, it connects to our kitchen and we got some real tall ceilings. You can jump in and say, oh, it seems like that'd be a great place to entertain. And then be quiet. They will be compelled to answer you. And the answer may be no, the answer may be yes, but they will give you information that they were never planning on giving you because of your observation. Yeah, what'd you have? Who's the author again? Oh, uh, the author is Chris Voss, V-O-S-S. -S. Yeah, you got it. But it seems like if they tell you all about how they've got an open fireplace, they've got windows on either side of it, it seems like that room's pretty drafty from all that space there. It must be pretty cold in there. Okay, you're gonna to start to uncover problems by using that it seems like. It's really, really powerful. You know, you can't rush into the presentation. That's a big one. We can't rush into the presentation. Slow is fast. If we are gonna do this right, honestly, uncovering the problem, it should take five to 10 minutes with every single customer before they ever get shown a fireplace. Yeah? Yes, that's so good. So he said reframing it. Go on. That is unbelievable. That is so good, reframing it. So after you've gotten your notes down, before you go to show them a solution, you can say, hey, yeah, so if I understand you right, you've got a 1,500 square foot house, and this main area here is it's a, it's an open living space, and you mentioned that you have a ceiling fan up there that can kind of blow the air around. So you're looking for a fireplace that looks really nice, number one, but is also gonna warm that space up, and you wanna burn gas. Am I understanding that correctly? You know, ask them permission, so good. Because they're gonna tell you yes. I mean, if they tell you no, then you go back and ask more questions. But the beauty of it is that then you go, you know what, I got a perfect solution for you. Do you mind if we go take a look at the fireplaces? I mean, the, you've just empathized with the customer. You understand their situation. Of course they wanna be shown fireplaces. It's really powerful. So next up is this. Now that we understand the problem and it's up to us to advise a solution, we can't give them too many bowling balls. This comes from StoryBrand and the idea of it is that every time you give a customer a piece of information, you are handing them a bowling ball. If you guys have ever heard me speak before, you're gonna say, Tim, I've heard this a million times. Shut up, I know it, okay? But it's the truth. Every time you give a consumer a piece of information, you are handing them a bowling ball, okay? How many bowling balls can I hold? Like two, like maybe three, and after that, I mean, things get pretty bad. 
It really does. It's no different with your customers. And so what happens is when we just shotgun our customers with, oh, this is a 35,000 BTU fireplace. It uses direct event technology. And it's got this amazing IPI system. Now the remote control is a modulating remote control. You know what? For the next two weeks, we got a free liner promotion on it, and we can get you scheduled in the next five weeks. I mean, like we have just thrown bowling balls at our customer and expected them to keep up. But that's what our salespeople do if we're not being intentional about it. It's what they do. We cannot give them too many bowling balls. So what we got to do is we uncover the problem is we got to think about what is the one bowling ball that I can give a customer that's going to be relevant. Okay? So going back to the intermittent pilot ignition system, if you've talked to a customer that has been used to an old gas log set, and you know, for years and years, they've been on their hands and knees, turning on the, the gas and throwing a match in there and almost catching their hair on fire every time. And they're covered in soot and their eyebrows are singed off. And they're, and they're coming in saying, oh my gosh, you know what? I, I just need something that's going to be an, an easier fix for me. OK, so say you're showing them a gas insert. Don't give them the bowling ball of direct vent technology. It doesn't solve their problem. You, know, you, you can say, hey, you know what, Mr. Jones? You know what, Mrs. Jones? I never want you to be on your hands and knees again. You go through everything on the intermittent pilot ignition system. You know what? Yeah, those old fireplaces, they got to burn that standing pilot light. And if you want to save money, every single time, you got to get on your hands and knees. I don't want that for you. I don't want your eyebrows coming off again. Okay? What, what we want is we're going to get you this fireplace that has a pilot on demand. Every time you hit the button on this remote, it's going to turn the fireplace on. When you turn it off, it's going to turn all the gas off. You're never going to have to get on your hands and knees again. How's that sound to you? That's what we got to say to customers. And that's, that one bowling ball is going to be so much more powerful than 45,000 BTUs, direct net technology, chase pan, free liner kit, because we're overwhelming them. We can't give them too many bowling balls. Now, number three is this, is that we need to create simple tools that make it easy for our teams to sell. It's funny. There's, there's a lot of things that, that I'm, I'm really proud of that, that I've been able to be a part of at, at my company. But honestly, out of everything I've done, the one thing that has made the biggest single difference in our company is creating a simple spreadsheet for our team to provide estimates with. That like literally that spreadsheet has made us millions of dollars. And it's not my training, it's not our salesmanship, it's not, it is, I'm not joking when I say this, it is this stupid spreadsheet that we use to price out customers. That if you can make it easy for your teams to sell, frankly, even if they're not great salespeople, they will sell more. But if you make it hard for your teams to sell, it's gonna be really, really difficult. So we're gonna jump into a few things that are gonna be just critical for your teams to sell. And number one is creating a simple sales process. This is the biggest gift you can give your team members. And even if, even if you're a mom and pop operation, even if it's just a couple of you, you will gain so much from having a sales process. Now, like I said before, we have a seven step sales process. And I know that sounds scary. Honestly, it is so easy. Okay, so guys, think about this. Customer walks in the showroom. What should step one of your sales process be? Greeting. greeting. You got it. Okay, step one is greet the customer. Okay, after I've greeted the customer, what is step two? What should I do next? Yes, find out what their issue is. Okay, we call it understand their problem. Okay, so now that I understand the problem, what's step three in the sales process? Solution. Yes, advise us. Guys, you guys are writing it for me, okay? You can make it easy. But the whole thing with this is that without a sales process, it's like telling your team that you want them to drive from here to New York and not giving them a map. They know that New York is somewhere over there. They know that it exists. And maybe if they meander around enough, they'll eventually get there. But it won't be very fast, it won't be very often, and it won't be on purpose. So the way that I look at this is that you need a sales process that gives clarity and direction to your team members. Because they can't give clarity to customers if they don't have clarity themselves. This is not micromanagement. This is painting lines on the basketball court so everyone's playing the same game. So if step one in our process is greeting, Sure, there's some things that we want in the greeting, but you know what? That's not micromanagement. It's just saying, hey, you know what? You got to greet the customer before you can do anything else. Okay, step two, understand. It's not micromanagement, but doesn't it logically make sense that we understand what their problem is before showing them a solution? Because I don't think we can show them a solution if we don't know what the problem is. So it's so intuitive, but these simple steps, it sounds so radically simple, but doing this is going to radically empower your sales team. What it's also going to do is allow you in sales practice, which all of you should do. You should be spending at least an hour every other week with your team doing live practice, but this is going to allow you to give feedback that actually makes a difference. 
You know, I referenced my friend, my friend Tim Rethlick, and he recently said to me that he said, he said, I knew someone once that said a room full of salespeople, it's like a room full of monkeys. Nearly every act is random. <laughs> And so often that's the case. And so when, you, when we try to give feedback, we, you can't give feedback to chaos. You can't give feedback to randomness because it never happens again. But if you've got a process that you're doing over and over and over, you can actually give candid feedback where people can work on their craft and make tangible differences. Do any of you guys have a sales process that you employ that's helped you out? So here's what's awesome about that, is that if you've had decent results without it, you will skyrocket your business once you start using it. You really will. It's gonna take some intentional effort, but it's totally worth doing. You know, next, invest in easy pricing tools. So this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier is that, is that man, manufacturers price books, God bless them. I can't understand half of them. I, I literally feel like I need a degree in biblical Greek to understand what is going on in a manufacturer's price book. And I, I mean, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but that's just, that's just my life. So what we've done, I'm not joking, the highest impact thing that I've ever done for our company was creating a simple spreadsheet to provide an estimate to any customer on any fireplace in less than five minutes in the showroom, not in the house. And if you guys can't quote a customer in the showroom in less than five minutes, you're losing. You really are. I know we sell a complex product, I'm not saying that it's got to be a perfect estimate. There's ways to give a range, to give a proposal, and then go out to the home and confirm it. But you got to give that number in the showroom. You got to lock it up. You know what? What? Because you, what you think about comparing it to is that your customer from their smartphone, like they can book a flight to Europe and back in in five minutes. They can they can get a quote for a Tesla in 30 seconds online, and they're saying, "Why is your fireplace any different?" Again. I know it's not a fair comparison, but that's the reality that our customers are living in. So I know that you guys can do this. Work on pricing tools. It's gonna to make such a wild difference and it is worth pouring the time and effort into. If you think you don't have time to do it, I would just encourage you to make time because so often we get caught in the hamster wheel, don't we? In the whirlwind, we're like, the end of the day comes and you're like, did I even do anything today? I mean, I swear like every November, there's like one day where I come home to my wife and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Do you guys have those days? <laughs> It happens so much. We got to invest in the important things. Yeah. Yeah, you absolutely can. And, and you know, honestly, it's so simple. You know, you can you can take the manufacturer's prices and you can combine different packages for the most common products that you sell. You're able to give great ranges to customers. They're not expecting a hard and fast bid, but they want an idea of what they're going to do. And I'm telling you, it's going to make a huge difference in your business. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great point. So she disagrees because when customers hear a number, that's the number that they hear. It's a very fair point. I would point back to the understanding phase of the process. If we do understanding right, we won't make those mistakes and we will bid the job based on all of our conversations in the show. And there's a way to document that for the customers. But that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, can fiddler on the roof dance on it? That's a great point. That's a great point. And we'll get to you in the back in just a second. But that, that's a really, really good point. That, that it, it absolutely comes down to speaking their language. And it takes time. I'm not saying this is easy. Guys, we're making it easy for our customers and our team members. We are not making it easy for us as leaders. This is hard work, but it's worth doing. It's worth doing. And these are the conversations that you got to be having with your teams. Well, wait, we can't do that. Okay, why can't we do it? Well, because we don't know what the roof pitch is. Or we don't know if it's going to go out the back. Okay, wait a minute. Are there questions we could ask? Are there things that we could do? Are there comparisons we can make to get that information? There, there's, there's ways to do it. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that it'll move the needle for you. Yeah. In the back, was there a question? Okay. Okay, perfect. 
So easy pricing tools. Guys, next up is this. As a sales leader, it is radically important to be able to give your team a way to manage their sales pipeline. It's so critical that we do this. You know, a sales pipeline is all that you have if you're gonna be a salesperson. Otherwise, you're just an order taker. So as sales leaders, we gotta be training up our team members, or even if it's just you as a mom and pop business, man, you know, you gotta pay attention to what's happening to the jobs in your pipeline. If you can give your team a way to manage the pipeline, it's gonna be so amazing. Because the truth of the matter is, our industry sucks at follow-up. They really do. I was having dinner a little while ago with some terrific companies that run amazing businesses and make a ton of money. And I asked them, I said, do you guys have a process for following up with your customers? I'd love to hear about it. And they got kind of embarrassed and they said, you know what? We don't. Maybe they get a call back once and after that I don't know, I don't know what happens to them. I mean, I, I think if we're honest, this is the truth. And I'm not joking, guys. The companies that can follow up with their customers are the companies that win. So you got to build this into your culture. There's ways to teach your team to manage their pipeline. You know, you could just keep a handwritten spreadsheet of all the estimates that you have. You could do a spreadsheet in Excel or in Google Sheets where someone logs in, the, you know, the date, the customer's name, the product they looked at. You, maybe you have a CRM system. If you do, that's amazing, but you, you got to make sure your team is using it. But one of the most effective things that we've done is we have rated our, our estimates on a scale of A, B, C, and D. A being the best, right? Low time, low risk, high profit, and D being the worst. And this is something I talk about a lot is that as a sales professional, there are four questions that you should always be able to answer. So I want to do an exercise and everybody raise your hand right now. We're going to see if there's anybody left. Okay. Got to be honest. If you talk to your sales team members, question, okay, leave your hand up if the answer is yes. If the answer is no, put your hand down. Okay. Question number one, do you know how many open proposals you have that haven't closed in the last three months? Question number two, which of those proposals are your best opportunities? Question number three, how many open proposals do you have in the last year? Question number four is what are you doing this week to engage those customers? Okay, there are four hands in the air. So again, it goes back to like, I'm not casting blame or anything like that. What this means, it means opportunity. Because if you guys are having success without this, holy cow, if you start following up with your customers, it's going to be insane, the growth that you'll have. You know, what we do is every A and B level customer, minimum of seven follow-ups. Minimum of seven. And, and all the time I get pushed back when I teach sales where people say, it's, it's too much, customers are going to get mad, they're going to tell me to go screw myself. And they don't. They really don't. They're thankful when you call them. Because again, they have a problem. And they get busy. They forget about it. And I, I give the analogy. It's like when my dentist calls me. I don't recognize the number, so I screen it. And then a little while later, I check the voicemail. And I'm like, oh, yeah, i got to make a dentist appointment. And then I'm at work a couple days later. I get the call again. I screen it again. I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know I need to do that. They keep calling me. You know, they got my number on file. And eventually, I pick up that phone. And I don't scream at them, why are you calling me about the stupid dentist appointment? I'm like, you know what? I've been so busy. Thanks for, thanks for being persistent. I'd love to get that scheduled. I'm not joking, guys. Customers are no different than that. you got to follow up with your customers. If you can build a pipeline for your team to understand their sales, understand what opportunities are out there, which ones are their best, and actively how they go about pursuing those, you're going to see some wild, wild success. Where do you get the number seven from? Well, so rule of seven touches is part of it. So famous marketing rule, no idea who made it up, but they say it takes seven touches before someone does business with you. I don't know if it's true or not, but I know that seven's better than three. And so we just, you know, we just decided on that. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there, I've, heard, I've heard people say, you know, you follow up until they fly by or die. I think, I think that, that that's good. Was there another question? Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you create a way for your team to like remember to follow up with them? If they have multiple jobs on the schedule, yeah. how, do you, how are you doing? Amazing question. What was your name? Robert. Robert. Awesome. That's a great question. So Robert asked how, when they're busy, how do you, you make it so this becomes routine? So I would say, number one, that you got to get some reporting involved. So basically... I make my team send me a weekly copy of their spreadsheet showing the last 30 days of activity. And I just want them to see, you know, hey, how many jobs did they add to it? What did they follow up on? What, you know, what's the status of the job? And so I just ask for that every week. Um, another thing you can do is if you're using Excel and you've got all these different categories, so you've got like the customer's name, phone number, address, unit type, you've got the, the rating of ABCD, throw a filter onto it and just filter out the A and B jobs 
and tell your team member, hey, this week, I want you to follow all these A and B jobs three times and then get back to me. You know, there's different ways that you can do it. Um, but it takes, as again, this is hard work as a leader. It's not easy. This is, this is intentional, difficult work. So to summarize, guys, we can make it easy with these three things. Number one, we cut out the noise. We speak with radical clarity. Number two, we reframe our messaging to only talk about the problems that we solve. And then number three, we create simple tools that our team can use to sell more. Because the truth of the matter is that there's never been more opportunity than there is right now. There, there really hasn't. You know, it bums me out. I read all these industry magazines, and so often you go to affiliate meetings or trade shows or things like that, and all there is is pessimism. People blame the weather. They blame NSPS. They blame their competition. They blame the online retailer. And what I keep thinking in my head is like, yeah, I, I get it. Like, those things are all factors. Don't get me wrong. But I can't do anything about those. What I can do something about is myself. If I can start blaming myself and saying, you know what, my system is uniquely and perfectly engineered to give me the exact results that I'm getting, I can go to work on that system. I believe there's never been more opportunity. If any of us go through our neighborhoods and knock on 10 doors asking what a gas insert is, none of our neighbors know. You know, we're not selling dishwashers in a commoditized market that's just blood red. We are in a blue ocean where the pie is bigger than we thought. Our competition is not the dealer next door. It's not ABC Fireplaces. Our competition is the apathy and indecision that we communicate to customers about our fireplaces. It's the truth. But with that opportunity, we can win. It takes going all in on simplicity and clarity, though. So again, guys, listening to me for an hour will not move the needle in your business. It will only move the needle if you go back, take this handout back to your business and start thinking about how can we go about rethinking what we do around simplicity and clarity. Now, I want to point you towards one more resource. This is a free resource. It's actually an ebook that I've written. And it's called Three Things Your Business is Doing to Confuse Customers. You can go to the website itsfiretime.com slash confuse and download it. It'll get sent right to your inbox. If you have a handout, it's actually an advertisement is in the handout right there. This costs you nothing. But what this does is it takes three of the big concepts from today and it really hashes them out in detail, but it gives you worksheets to go through so you can spend some time actually addressing this so you can stop confusing customers and you guys can win. So go to the website itsfiretime.com slash confuse and go ahead and download that. Also, if you'd like to, I have a podcast. There's some advertisements where uh, they're, they should be on the tables in front of you. It's called the Fire Time Podcast. We're actually going to be launching season two starting on Friday here at Expo. But it's basically a podcast to share best practices in the industry. So if this content has been remotely helpful, if it's made you think, if you have questions, it's available on Apple and in Google, you know, wherever it is you listen to podcasts, you can search for the Fire Time Podcast. Because the truth is, guys, we don't want to settle for mediocre results. I know that things have been good the last couple years, but so often for a company, good means mediocre single-digit growth. I mean, those are mediocre results, right? That's what inflation does. We should be getting that kind of growth because of inflation. We can't settle for that. You guys work too hard in your businesses to settle for results that aren't wild. So with the content today, if we make it easy for our customers, guys, you're able to take control. And I know that if you can remove the confusion that so many customers feel, literally your company will be like a city on a hill. Your customers are swimming in a world of chaos. They know they have a problem, but no one can help them. Your company will be a beacon, a magnet that will draw them to you. You guys have the ability to take control of your company and make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there is no excuse not to. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here.